you all so very much uh, for coming to this Botany 360 event. I'm screen sharing now so you can see my little Google Slides presentation. It's not that exciting. Um, but this is one of many offerings by the Botanical Society of America through the Botany 360 program, which is really exciting. So why 360? Well, it's because uh, our annual meeting, the Botany Conference, is about five days long. And so we're trying to extend professional development, networking, and other rel rel relevant activities uh, throughout the rest of the year. Uh, so this is an event that kind of got started in a spontaneous moment at the Botany Conference uh, this past year in Anchorage, Alaska. And uh, it is being co-hosted by the Educational uh, Committee and the teaching section. So kind of part of what we're going to do is talk a little bit about the, the structure of the Botanical Society and the ways in which people that are interested in education uh, can get involved. And so to that end, like here's a rough little outline of what we're going to do. Um, we're going to introduce ourselves, um, where we are at, did we attend Botany 2022, whether that was in person in Anchorage or in an online hybrid format, and what is your role in education? Okay, so I'll get started. Uh, I'm Rachel Jabaley. I'm an associate professor at Colorado College, which is an undergraduate serving liberal arts school in Colorado Springs. Uh, the second city of Colorado. It's not Boulder, it's us. Um, I am the uh, director at large for education for the Botanical Society of America, which is an elected role on the board. So some of the stuff that we're going to talk about and brainstorm about today um, are ideas that I can bring back to the board, uh, which we're starting to meet next week. And we'll be talking a lot about the future of the Botany Conference, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I'm going to have Ben introduce themselves, and then you can pick someone else to introduce themselves. Working on it. Okay, here I am. Uh, hi, I'm Ben Montgomery. Um, I am here as, I guess, now chair of the teaching section. Um, which is easy to confuse with the education, let me get this right, education committee and the teaching section. And so the teaching section is really focused on um, providing opportunities at the botany meeting for people to uh, discuss and present on teaching strategies, um, as well as oftentimes mentoring strategies. Um, and it is one of the sections that you can join when you renew your membership. Obviously, we encourage you to do so um, and to come to our talks as well as the more traditional science talks at the meeting and participate as much as possible in things like our um, annual meeting um, at the conference. There's a lot of opportunities, I think, for more uh, Botany 360 activities involving teaching, where we could, you know, talk about specific um, questions about teaching, specific topics that we want to discuss as a group, um, how we could better teach. And so I would, you know, hope that we can see everybody in more of these sessions going forward. Uh, before I go further, um, we were asked to put a survey about today's event into the chat. And um, obviously, it makes sense to do this at the end, but we know that not everyone can stay for the entire time. So if you do need to leave early, then please just go back to the start of the chat here to access the survey. And if all goes well, I've got a link here. Oh, great. I think Rachel just uh, pasted the in. So that will give feedback about both what is uh, helpful with these events and what we can do to make them more productive going forward. Um, academically, um, I am um, a uh, botanist at U University of South Carolina Upstate in Spartanburg, South Carolina. I'm also department chair 
and today was the first day of spring enrollments. So I'm a somewhat frazzled department chair today. And let me see who else is here. Um, and the next person I see on the list is Amy McPherson. So Amy, I'll let you introduce yourself next. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Amy McPherson. I'm the Director of Publications for the Botanical Society of America. I don't really have a, a, um, a direct tie to um, education. I'm just really interested in the topic of this um, uh, webinar and I'm pleased to be, to, to be here and to learn uh, what you guys are talking about. And I will pass it on to Maya. Hello, um, my name is Maya Shamsadine, and I'm located in Albuquerque, New Mexico on Tewa land. I did attend Botany 2022 in Alaska, um, and I'm currently on fellowship, but I was a graduate teaching assistant. And I'm here because I used the um, one of the botany posters from my first, yeah, from my first botany conference in my class but I don't know how to integrate anything else. So that's what I'm here to figure out today is thinking about how can we use um, some of the cool materials or just like what we learn at Botany um, in the classroom. And then I will pick uh, Bob. Hi everybody, I'm Bob Noyd. I, I can't seem to get my camera to work just today. It was not an easy, uh, easy catch on. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good, at least my mic is working. Hi, I'm Bob Noyd, and um, I am at the US Air Force Academy where I teach uh, an introductory botany course, and I have for many years. And um, I'm also working with Ben as uh, on the teaching section of BSA, and uh, we just kind of joined forces a little bit this summer when uh, we were elected to the slate, so I'm excited about that. Um, I work with, uh, future Air Force officers who wear their camouflages to school every day, which look like plants. So that's kind of interesting. And um, this is a great topic because um, I learned so much botany at uh, Anchorage. It was so nice uh, to be into a lot of lot of um, um, talks and lectures. And I'm always trying to figure out how to create better classroom activities get students to apply what they learn in the basics to uh, the great plants like the bromeliads that Rachel always talks about. So anyway, I'll pass it on. Who's next there? I see Maya, I see Ben, I see uh, Rachel there. How about you, Jennifer? Hi, I'm Jennifer Hartley. I work for the BSA. I am the education program supervisor. So I work under Katrina Adams. Um, my primary my primary role is to like run and oversee the planting science platform and keep those wheels turning every session. Um, I was at Botany Conference. It was my first conference, so that was exciting. Um, but it was my first one, so I can't say how I think it differs. <laughs> Other than, aside from just, I really enjoy it very much. Um, I will throw it to Brooke. Should I throw it to Sadie instead? Sure. Um, <laughs> hi, <laughs> I'm I'm Sadie, um, and. Let's see, I am in Bothell, Washington, so just north of Seattle, north of Lake Washington. Um, and this is the land of the Coast Salish peoples. And I um, so I teach at a community college. So I teach at Cascadia College, which is a community college. So this is like first two years. Um, I was actually, the first botany conference I attended was this past summer. So I was part of the Inclusive Teaching Initiative. So that was, really very cool. Yeah, it was super cool. Um, and so while I've incorporated like one small thing into my courses, um, I am looking, you know, similar to, um, to Maya, I'm really looking to incorporate more. So that is why I am here today. So I will pass it on to Adam. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes late. 
Um, let's see. So I'm Adam Schneider. I am currently uh, at the University of Wisconsin in La Crosse, one of the regional PUIs for the UW system. Um, I did not attend Botany this year. I was really looking forward to, but um, I actually changed jobs. And so I was busy with a move and other kind of other stuff that kept me from um, getting married. That happened also right when the conference was meeting. So I couldn't do that uh, this year. Uh, previously, I was teaching at Hendricks College, uh, which is a liberal arts college uh, in central Arkansas. I was there for four years. So that's kind of, uh, yeah, I think that's me. I, um, I, I was saying why, maybe anything else? <laughs> Um, I guess I'll just say I'm also excited uh, to kind of see what to join this webinar because I've frequently thought about, especially during um, when everything was online with COVID, how useful it might be to pull some of this into my classes, especially being at a small liberal arts college where students maybe have less likelihood to get exposure to all the different facets of plant biology, um, but have never yeah, I'm always looking for new ideas on how to do that. And, and so I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Brooke, are you here? <laughs> that's all right. Um, oh, wait. Uh, yep, that's all good. Um, okay, so Brooke, Brooke is paying attention. But OK, well, thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'm really appreciative of so many people who are involved with various PUIs. Um, when we talk about um, in topic two, kind of the BSA structure, we can talk a little bit about the PUI section of the Botanical Sec uh, Society of America. Um, okay, but in the, in the uh, to keep on time, um, I think we'll start on kind of our first topic. Okay, so the idea of all of this, and I think you all are ready for this moment, right, is that there's so much amazing content uh, that we all produced um, for our now hybrid conferences. So prior to COVID, right, uh, the Bonnie conference, as were most conferences, were very ephemeral. Like if you were not in the room, at the talk, that was your one shot to see it. Um, now, for the past couple years, right, we have had um, talks have to be recorded. Well, I guess one time there was one, we've had one botany conference where you could be in person, but we also had recorded content available and then several years of recorded content. Um, and that was required that if you were going to give a talk in many of the traditional sections, you had to uh, record your talk ahead of time. So you have access to the um, abstract, which we always had in the past, and now these recorded talks. Um, now these are behind a paywall kind of, in that the only people that can access them, right, uh, registered for the conference, and it's hosted by Pathables for one year, and then uh, the content is gone. Now, when I look at our BSA YouTube channel in 2019, which was the last conference before COVID in person, we had recordings of people giving talks, including one of me, which I totally forgot about. And then I refound it today. And that was kind of weird. Um, and I think, you know, there's an interest in what can we do moving forward to make some of this content available for different reasons, right? Um, so we're going to kind of explore our interests as educators, and especially educators in November who might be real tired of providing content and would like maybe some help from our colleagues at providing new, exciting ideas, lessons, etc. Okay, so for this first section, um, we're going to consider sort of your standard 13 to 15 minute research talks, um, whether those were in um, colloquia or symposia or any of the various other usual sections. 
Um, and I had this idea and like, we're kind of at the size that breakout rooms might make sense. We might decide that we only like a couple of these topics, but here's four ideas. And I thought we would go into breakout rooms and you could kind of craft like a template little lesson plan, maybe aimed at undergrads. Um, maybe like intro level students might be like a real similar kind of mind frame there with these kind of four different ideas. So the first one would be using a talk to shape a literature review or library resource session. The second one would be using a talk to explore the scientific method. The third one would be critiquing the science communication of a talk. And then the fourth one would be using a talk to explore kind of the development of ideas of a research group, particularly maybe rooted in their past publications, their website, whatever. So those are just the four topics I came up with. Um, and the thought was that, you know, you could go into a breakout room for like 15 minutes. And then um, in this little PowerPoint, which I'll give you a link to, we could just kind of record you could make this as structured or just kind of like lesson plan-y or just some ideas or whatever. And you could even root it in a real talk if, you, if you're linked in, if that's something that you wanted to do, then we'd share and then you could switch topics. Um, does that seem okay? You wanna give me a little emoji love or thumb? Mm. Okay, cool. So, and if nobody picks a topic, I'm going to just kind of, you know, that's fine. And um, we can, um, maybe someone would pick it the second time or whatever. Okay, so you all see the numbers of the talks. Okay, I am going to, first of all, here's the link to the Google slide. We all love a random Google link. There's so many, right? And um, I'm going to open up the four breakout rooms. And you can choose. And they are open now. So go have fun. If you're alone, that's sad. Give it a second and then maybe go somewhere else. Okay, go have fun. Uh, I'm not seeing the breakout rooms yet. What? That's silly. Um, oh, wait. No, there they go. Okay. Yay. There's so far a lot of love for rooms one and two, less so for three and no love for four. See, I'm having trouble. I was in room one for a second and then I came it back. You? Hmm. But now I can't seem to rejoin it or any room. Um, you know, try leaving the meeting and coming back. Yeah, try that. Bob, you're in here twice. <laughs> now I see you. And I can't hear you. <laughs> Sadie. I can't hear you. Zoom freak out uh, time. Yeah, no one was in room three. I don't Ben's there now. Oh, is he? I'll go back. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Now room one died. This is hilarious. This I don't is know super funny. <laughs> People are moving. Oh my God. Oh God. Everybody's in one breakout room. I have no idea what's happening here. What what size groups do you want? Like three I, I just want people to go at where what interests them. So 
Oh my gosh. Uh, you want to go to room three? I'm going to move you to room three. Um, I, I just oh, tried to you. move you. <laughs> okay. Jason. <laughs> Hello. Whoa, okay. All right. Hi, oh. <laughs> sorry, that made it all weird. <laughs> Illustrating the big picture, like I'm having trouble articulating this. So like if they make a flow chart, right? Cause you're saying that you're, you're not like bogged down in the density of a paper but you can kind of see the bigger picture because people are forced to contextualize their work. So maybe they can like do a box and say like, you know, this is important because of X, Y, and Z from the intro of the talk. These are the questions. This is how they approach those questions. And this is the result. Um, is yeah. kind of what I'm trying to write, but. <laughs> well, and it, they also just, it makes a better exemplar for kids that are not familiar with the method already, that don't have background in it at all. Because if they were just reading the paper, like the 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 narrative of how did we decide that this is what we wanted to study? How did we, why was this even remotely interesting to you in the first place? Kind of can be lost, you know? And so I think mm -hmm. whether there's an activity associated with it or not, being able to hear them talk about it helps a lot like it helps make it relatable and then they can see like oh okay so you're not just like pulling these weird concepts out of the air and then does you know or somebody's not just handing you an assignment and saying search research this this way right there, there's actually like a motivation there I will say that with the kids that I work with and have worked with for years this kind of you know hearing them talk about it helps them better understand what a hypothesis is for Mm -hmm. that is something that is terrible <laughs> you know like we like I, part of it is the problem that we we have science teachers that don't really understand what it's for either other than that it's like the box you have to check in order for your students projects to be ready for the science fair mm -hmm. so helping them to to kind of get to that I think is also a big reason why this could be helpful I think um, what's, this is a little bit of a detour here, but I think 
I've definitely been to talks where they didn't directly state their hypotheses though. Right. Um, and so it would be kind of cool to pair a talk that says, you know, this is our research questions. This is what we hypothesized and why versus a talk that doesn't say that too. That would be kind of cool to do for the students to really hone in that point of like, why do we, why do we even have a hypothesis? Like, why do we have something like that? Absolutely. I think that's such an important point. And I think about so many like phylogenetics and systematics talks. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm of that field and we're, I think, particularly bad at viewing our work through a hypothesis brain based framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it'd be pretty amazing to find a talk in systematics that does that really well. Mm -hmm. But it might not be the best for like beginning students in general. Yeah. I'm going to go visit the other breakout room. <laughs> okay. Um, so Brooke said talks. And, um, and Sorry, make it weird. <laughs> And so, um, so I love this idea of just showing them a talk and saying like, okay, what, what did, um, maybe what did the speaker do well at? What could they, what are their growth points, which is similar to what we would do so that they have just an idea of what a talk could even look like. You know, what, what struck me, uh, Adam is when I, when I, go to the botanical conference talks is how do they measure that? How do they quantify pollination visits or what do they do? Uh, and oh, they take, you know, leaf area or something to that effect. I guess one thing that's really lacking from my intro course is this idea that scientists go out and measure things. And that's true for botanists. So, they have a question and then they go out and measure it. And I just, I wonder if we could just, for me anyway, hone in on that one piece of what the talk is, um, kind of the, the characteristic of the talk that, um, you know, like inbreeding depression, how do they measure that? And well, the number of ovules, the fruits, uh, et cetera, that, um, really takes thought my course from just giving them information that's already been discovered to how did they discover that? I like that. Yeah, and there's so many great studies that are testing important questions that also aren't, you know, you that don't have super advanced or technical methods, right? Like you said, like counting things or, you know, measuring fitness, like, you know, you don't need some super fancy chromat you know, chromatography spectroscopy gizmo to, to do that, but you have to think about, you know, basic questions about the life history of your organism and what's practical and what, you know, what assumptions can you make and are they fair? And so I, I like, those like the opportunity to dig into some of those aspects and that sometimes yeah sometimes you'll get people including in their talks like pictures of their field site or things like that that don't make it into the the papers yeah i like that Have you all talked about the balance of like text on slides versus um, what people say and the kind of the interplay of those things? And then the sheer pacing of slides, like how many slides per minute? Is there a good rule of thumb for that, um, et cetera? No, but yeah, just but some good thoughts. ideas. <laughs> um, text size and readability. Yep, yep. So Rachel, you're talking, 
Oh, go ahead. The present. Oh, so Rachel, you're just talking about the presentation dynamics, the ability to communicate. The, yeah. You know, the, the overload that people put on slides. Mm -hmm. and, um, looking at good examples versus perhaps less than good examples. Yep. Yep, I think I think that can be very useful. And then thinking critically as someone who's watching it, like wh what are you looking at? Are you listening to the words? Are you focusing on figures? Are you reading the text? Sometimes there's so much text that they're in conflict with each other, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think allowing the students to critique is, is a pretty powerful thing in and of itself. Yeah, and I would imagine that'd be a great learning activity if you're going to prepare them to do their own talk. Yeah. Yes. In fact, that would be a great um, pre-activity. Uh, yeah. You know, prerequisite support material or activity. Yeah. Yeah, I, like I think it. that's a that's a great point right there. Yeah. I can even imagine sort of meta student meta talks about the talks where. <laughs> You have a group of four students who critique a 15 minute talk and then give a 10 minute critique where they can sort of fast forward through to show some of the good things and some of the bad things in the talk they're critiquing. And that way, all students in the class would get to see four or five different portions of talks and intens intensively engage with one of them. I think that's really cool. And then you have to, you're we're not really thinking about content now. We're thinking about solely about communication and presentation. Yeah. 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 It's a little hard, I think, sometimes with the talks that we have available because sometimes there's the embedded video of the person talking and sometimes not. So it is different than if you're watching like the YouTube BSA talks of actual people giving PowerPoints from before. Whereas now it's a lot of just disembodied voices. And I'm guilty of this. That's how I did mine. I was like, I don't want to be on video. Um, but you could also have the students think about like, what's the difference when you don't see the person talking versus it, yeah. Or, or if you had one in which you did see the person. Yeah. And we can also, if it's important for them to see the person, we can choose that subset. Yeah. I'm going to go check in with the other and we'll might do like what maybe like three or four more minutes here and then we'll come mm -hmm. back together. That's sufficient. Sounds good. Cool. Class, we had a we had a herbivory project and there was like one group who's they had to have like a meeting with one of the intervention. <laughs> yeah, they're like, hey, you need to step up. Um, but I think the talks, it's really cool when people talk, like they put people's picture. And they say this part of the project is being done by this person. And so you can see that like even at like these higher levels, there's people who are, you know, people can still work on pieces, but then still be like a group entity yeah. for the, um, yeah. I can see how that would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. And also just the level of accountability that that, like my name's gonna be on that slide. I better make sure I <laughs> that, you know, yeah. A part of the paper turned in. Y'all are awesome. You went on to a whole other room. I appreciate that. Um, we are going to maybe pull it all back together here in two minutes. Does that sound okay? Sure. Yep. Yay. Yeah, I liked this topic because I was thinking a lot about how showing the linkage through time of ideas and um, the emphasis that these botany talks are like the freshest newest piece of the story and mm -hmm. that they didn't emerge from nothing that they're rooted in past ideas past scholars And it could be a great way to like, you know, do like the literature search sorts of ideas with students. If you're thinking about library resources, it's like, okay, well, how could we find um, articles by this person? How often do they work with this other person, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm.
I'm going to do the 60 second countdown. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's that new, there's that website now where you can track like people's, um, it's almost like genealogy, but for people's labs and you can see maybe, I don't know, that might be kind of fun to do with the people, the authors of the talk too. And you can think about how ideas don't happen. Like, you know, the I ideas are like a confluence of a whole bunch of dinner interactions. Yeah, it's almost like a taxonomy of people's <laughs> <laughs> people's professional mentorship. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to leave. I hit the enter because. <laughs> Oops. Oh well, that's okay. I just need to jot that down. That's real fine. Quick. Yeah. <laughs> What is that called? It's like that. It's like science. I know exactly what you mean. I've done it before. And I always have to like look deep into Twitter to find where it was. <laughs> is that relatively new? I heard about it. Yeah. Like maybe like a year or two ago. Yeah. Maybe. Apparently it's yeah, very I... common in like physics. Like there's like posters in halls of like physics departments. They're very into that sort of thing. Oh, Katrina was talking about that. Like we used to walk every couple of days and she would talk about this idea that she was working with somebody on. I wonder if it's the same site. Hmm. Yeah. How far removed are you from the Missouri Botanical Garden? Less far than you think. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, um, I hope that was useful and interesting. There were some really exciting discussions I was part of, and it looks like people were populating some stuff in um, the, the PowerPoint slides. Um, would somebody want to just speak briefly to what the room two was talking about related to the scientific method? It's either you or me. You're going to make me talk about it? <laughs> we, we talked about Josh. <laughs> yeah, we, we, would, we talked about, well, we talked about it. It just makes a great exemplar and, and a more complete exemplar than even reading the paper would do because usually in the course of a talk, um, people are more you know, they're more willing to provide this whole narrative behind what led to them exploring that particular topic or how they landed on the, even the method that they went on and things like that more so than they would necessarily do in the talk. And so often in more accessible language for students that maybe aren't deep into science just yet. Um, and then we talked about some exercises like having them make a flow chart around that and kind of trace that path from beginning to end. Um, we also talked a lot about hypotheses for this one because like I personally work with uh, six through 12th grade. So I am well below what the most of you are dealing with. Um, but that remains this big stumbling block. You know, kids don't really understand it. A lot of teachers don't completely understand it. Um, so talking about when you would need one and how they're used, you know, seeing an actual, you know, ex an actual uh, research program and action where you can see the application of that would be really helpful for my level for sure. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. want anything Maya? And we thought that like a good way to illustrate, um, you know, hypotheses and why they're important is to have a talk that uses them and then one that doesn't. And then we could also discuss, well, maybe there, there's a, uh, less appropriate framework for generating a hypothesis versus a hypothesis versus not. And then the other thing I would add is that we wanted to, before the, the students watch the talk is explain exactly what the scientific method is. That way they can bring those two concepts together once they see it in uh, the actual talk. Awesome. Hmm. How about our room three, critiquing the science communication of a talk?
I forgot what room I was in. That was you. <laughs> that was everybody <laughs> who didn't just talk. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll start it off anyway a little bit. Um, so we were um, listening to Adam who was using, um, he was using his talks, to, uh, the recordings of talks and pairing them with the paper. And I thought that was a fabulous idea one I hadn't thought of, I kind of just thought of in the past, I've given my students a paper, even a part of a paper, but I never thought of actually pairing it with the talk. And I, I, I love that idea. And so we, ch we chatted quite a bit about that. Um, but we were thinking of how much content was in the Botany Conference. And, and sometimes that content is above the heads of our introductory, at least my introductory course, or of my students. But then we started to talk about um, the communications part. I think Rachel came into our room and um, steered us more toward the communication issues of uh, analyzing and critiquing the slides themselves, the text, the image balance, the clarity of graphs and data that is presented. Is the data graphs too complex for the audience to assimilate within a minute or two with it, the slide is on the screen? Um, so I, I really, then we kind of shifted into that communication and, but then we lamented the fact that teaching scientific communication may not will take time away from the content goals we have. Um, but uh, that that would be a great idea to have the students critique the slides, critique the talk in preparation for trying to accomplish their own presentations uh, on a talk. So um, I know I got a lot out of the breakout room and, and, and enjoyed it. And what else, Ben or Adam want to chip in? I thought that was a great summary, Bob. So thanks. Yep, awesome. I, I already got an idea from today. How's that? Hey, if you get something out of this, it was worth it. I love it. Um, so then our room two bounced to room four and thought about the this idea. Would you like to speak to that briefly? Sure. Um, so we were kind of going into this discussion anyways. And so we were like, well, maybe we'll move to another room. And they were like, oh, we're discussing this. And so um, we were talking about how talks are really great because you get so much more context about, well, why are we interested in this question? And so you can have either that, that process of, oh, well, we saw this weird population in Nevada or what have you, or you can have something like we, um, we were familiar with this work from previous research. And so um, those two top points is that curiosity, like maybe an observation about the natural world leading into developing a research question. Or you can have a building of your, of your career or your program where you're generating new results, you're generating new knowledge, but then you're also having new questions about what you're seeing. Um, and then we also started to focus on the research group portion of this, um, rather than just developing ideas where, you know, mentorship, so who you do your schooling with or your peer influences, so the other people who are in your lab or your research group um, can influence how you develop ideas, and these ideas are often not generated, like, in a silo, like, Sometimes, you know, people are walking along and they have a whole new question, but oftentimes it's through conversation. And so thinking about the the group or like the social part of developing uh, research. And then we talked about um, using the talk, especially for talks that have pictures of people. It's like a larger project. And so they are like, oh, and such and such is, is working on this portion of the project. And so we talked about using that as an example of how science is collaborative and how you can have positive collaboration that you can mirror as a student in your research group or your during your lab project or what have you. Um, and so that's what we talked about using uh, talks for research group idea. I love it. I love it. That was really great. Um, 
Bob had a question about how we can all keep in contact. Well, everyone just throw their email onto like maybe the lead slide or something. So we have that because that's that's really important. Um, that was some great ideas. Um, so I initially thought we would like go to another breakout room and talk about one of the others. But now I'm wondering if this is a better idea. Um, what if we took the next, you know, 10 or 15 minutes since so many of us went um, or participated in online botany or, or in-person botany? And what if we went, looked back at our schedule or just wherever and um, started populating this with examples that we think might fit one of these lessons? Like, what do you think was a great example if you have memory and it could even be your talk but do you recall anything that was a great example that could be used for teaching so if you want to go like pull like the title maybe just the title is fine and then like a one phrase why it also could be a negative example if you want to play it that way um but do you think that would be a good use of our next little chunk of time um, I just want to clarify this, this recording will be public. Ooh, true. Okay. That's fair. Um, so let's I mean, go with positive examples. Does that sound good? Like talks we think were a great example of the scientific method. They spoke clearly to hypotheses, something like that. Okay. So let's have like, we're going to go to the top of the hour with quiet time hunting in the internet. Um, and yeah, then we can maybe briefly share some of that before moving on. We're going to keep it just a half hour after that. Sorry, to clarify, these are body talks or just general or body talks? Or? Yeah, yeah. So like in theory, you're one step closer to actually being able to implement this. Um, Rachel? Yeah. Can I, can I make a suggestion? Yes, please. Um, when we actually get to the implementation part, we, uh, I think there's some topics that you have on that, on the outline about yeah. some of the challenges in implementing. And so, um we can find examples here but they're not necessarily ones that we would have permission to use what um, do you mean well uh it's like some of the questions are what kind of consent do we need from the person being recorded to use this outside what, what are the legal constraints on posting the talks from pathable to youtube right and and um, i don't think we're considering doing that at all this year i'm hoping for this topic three that we think about like what recommendations can we give to bsa as we think about botany 2023 yeah. and maybe moving more to youtube but also thinking about right now like what consent did these people give um et cetera, et cetera. So like right now you can just kind of put some names down, but like, yeah, we're not saying go ahead and do exactly whatever it is you want to do. Cause then, yeah, you're right. We should come back and talk about consent. Okay. As, as long as everyone knows it's just examples for now. Yeah. Good point. Rachel, I was that student that wasn't paying attention. <laughs> um, could you just 
Of course. Yeah, no worries. To ask for me, I was pushing emails onto chat. Totally. No, that's that's I'm not sorry. a problem. So we're going to just take until the top of the hour to go probably back into our agendas through Pathable to the meeting and maybe try and remember some talks we saw or maybe okay. things we've seen subsequently and see if any of them we think might be great for some of these um, kind of lesson plans that we're thinking about okay great so i can go back to my yeah 20, yeah 22. Okay. exactly see if you can log in and see if you remember any of them and if you don't it's totally fine okay thanks rachel uh-huh hello by the way hello <laughs> colorado <laughs> springs <laughs> oh, no.
let's take like maybe one or two more minutes to wrap up and then maybe we'll share a couple that we really like and why. All right. Um, I don't know how that was for you. It was funny to look back at my agenda and realize how many of the talks I put in my agenda I didn't go to. Ooh, um, <laughs> but I do remember the ones I went to, which was great. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I set lofty goals for myself for continued um, watching of talks after the meeting. And this whole experience is reinvigorating my desire to do just that. Um, I found that of, of the various types of, of potential lessons, the um, uh, scientific communication one, there were several talks that really stood out to me. Um, Jen Ackerfield's talk about uh, describing new thistle species and making it um, how to tell a good story for the media that the media is going to pick up, I, I thought was particularly amazing. Um, the Black Botanical Legacies slate of talks, including Maya's, was amazing. Um, I'm particularly remembering Tanisha Williams, I think, as another masterpiece of like storytelling, strong narrative structure. Um, now these aren't traditional like science talks per se, um, but I think this is a good reminder that there's lots of other things at the Botany Conference besides standard kind of research talks. Does somebody else wanna to speak to one that they remembered or think might be useful in the future in this way? I'll just say that I also went straight for Jennifer Ackerfield's Circe talk because she did do such a great job of presenting that like as a mystery and telling the whole story about how they, you know, how they landed on that species, how what, all the steps they took to unpack what it was and where, you know, how to find it and how to keep it safe and all that stuff. And so it was, I thought that one was especially good. I also really liked, um, and this was in that same talk, which is really why I'm thinking of it that it was one of the few I was able to get to because as staff, we couldn't get out much. But the uh, Megan Fox um, talking about use, you know, presenting science in these more popular culture outlets and things like that, you know, at the again, I'm I tend to go toward high school and that's something that it's a very relatable medium for them. So having them explore science or see people using that to talk about science is really helpful. Anybody else? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in a little bit, Rachel. Um, 
just like you and Jennifer, I went to uh, Jen's talk. She's so animated. Um, she's so knowledgeable. She's so clear um, and warm. And uh, it really exudes the passion of botany. And um, her, as well as part of that Asteraceae uh, colloquium, I think it was, or symposium, uh, was really great. And so I would agree with that. I couldn't sign in because I couldn't find my login number, my password, but I went through, I took lots of photos of slides at the meeting. Um, I feel always a little self-conscious about doing that. I don't do it to take anybody's intellectual property. I simply get it so that I can just do what you did, which is remind myself of um, the elegance of someone's method, um, the colorful flowers that are matched up with a phylogenetic tree. There was one um, that uh, on Silene, which is a, um, a species that is here in Colorado that I really like. And so uh, one of the grad students was uh, working on that and we connected on one of the field trips and she gave an excellent uh, graduate school talk, master's level talk on Silene and the red color. And I remember uh, going out to her after and saying what a great job she did. She was again, uh, she didn't overfill the slides. And so anyway, I, I, I just went to a lot of talks and um, I took a lot of photos and the poster sessions too uh, were very uh, informative. So anyway, that's kind of my contributions to uh, that, but I can't have to, <laughs> have to go back and get my password to get on to my agenda. But I had probably two or three dozen slides and photos of slides. Yeah, I had similar problems getting my password. I had to reset it. The one that was saved didn't work. And I heard <laughs> other people had the same problem. You know, I've, one I, thing I'm yeah. thinking about as, as we're talking is that in the future, when I go to botany meetings, like we're all taking notes in different ways. And you're right, using our phones a lot to take photos. And maybe as opposed to just thinking about like scientific areas that I'm interested in, I'll be thinking also as an educator and thinking about, you know, what talks I could use in my teaching in the future and having like some categories um, maybe ready ready to go to like slot some into kind of hunting for content. Um, okay, cool. Well, I'm gonna kind of keep us on time. We're gonna just talk briefly, I think about the, the structure of education at BSA and the meeting. And we already were talking about some of the colloquium and, and symposia that are specific to education. Um, ben, do you wanna give an overview and remind us of some of the specific programming for education that happens? Um, sure. So the, uh, and I actually, Rachel, I might ask you to, sure. to help with the parts that I'm less familiar okay. with. Um, for the teaching section, we tend to have multiple sessions um, throughout the conference with somewhere in the ballpark of a total of 20 to 30 talks, um, just estimating, and then also um, usually a, a good number of posters, somewhere in the dozen, couple dozen posters. And you know these talks are all about either teaching or outreach. And I'd say there's a split about 50-50 between those topics, um, ranging from everything from teaching below the college level up to mentoring graduate students. And so there's, there's a big diversity of those talks. Um, some of them are data-driven, many of them are descriptive in nature. Um, and some of them are really intended to help the audience learn how to do something. Others are more intended to describe, you know, what was done in a more traditional uh, type of talk. Um, uh, Rachel, do you feel comfortable talking about some of the, uh, the symposia that, or the- Oh, I'm sure, remember, the yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Jennifer probably can too. Like there, there was a lot of very specific um, grants that helped fund 
um, the participation of people from community colleges, um, uh, who we had a member here who had to jump off, um, and uh, presentations about their work, um, as well as other broader topics in teaching. And so all of a lot of those talks are available uh, still for us all to go look at. The teaching section is always like some of my favorite sets of talks to go to. Um, unfortunately, the posters we don't have access to. So as we kind of transition now into like critiques, maybe best practices moving forward, not having access now to the posters um, seems kind of like a shame for sure. Um, but there's, yeah, so there's part of the scientific program are teaching specific talks. The teaching section is usually what has it. Um, as a section, you get to have access to some funds, which is very exciting. Um, and then people can put together colloquium and symposium presentation ideas on on topics that might be about education. And so, gosh, I should know if if I think the deadline's just about closed. I know they extended it, but um, they were putting together the list or pre people are proposing symposium colloquia for botany 2023 in Boise. So it'll be very interesting to see uh, what various education groups might have put together uh, related to that. So, um, you know, I'm very proud of how much great work there is on education, both at the collegiate level and um, K-12, certainly with everything that Jennifer and everybody's doing related to planting science um, and so many of the other grants. So we are, you know, the home of botanical education um, at all education levels. And that that comes through the conference. And so those resources there are there. Um, one resource that's not there, though, of course, are the workshops. Um, so as we think about what content's available and what's not, uh, the workshops are not, as of right now, uh, available online. Um, so, ooh, Jennifer put a link. Have they announced the plan? Oh, Jacqueline Gill's doing the plenary? That's some hot gossip. I didn't know that. Oh my God. That's that's big. Talk yeah, about the news right here. Tower House. I didn't know. That's exciting. Well, she just announced it like an hour ago. What? So. <laughs> that is the fresh gossip in town. Oh my goodness. Jacqueline Gill is an amazing educator. And so that's going to be very, very cool. What was the name, Rachel? Jacqueline Gill, uh, she's a professor, I believe, at University of Maine and uh, really active on social media. I believe she's doing a podcast. She does a lot of paleo work. Um, members of our Botanical Society have grants with her. I mean, she's she's very, very um, a, an amazing scholar and amazing communicator. So that is amazing. I'm so excited to hear that. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, okay. So let's in our final bit here, kind of transition to thinking about, you know, what changes, if any, we might want to suggest for like botany 2023 and content. And then also think about as content creators, how can we get what, what should be best practices for ensuring their um, consent to have their materials used. Um, so, you know, I, I think about this one way. It's like, okay, I had to record a talk to participate. And um, sometimes, you know, the talks that we record are very ephemeral. And they were like, this was how far I could push the data at this time. And it's not published. And as soon as it's done, it's kind of obsolete. Um, I imagine if I was a very prolific researcher, which I am not anymore, that I would be like, oh, that's out of date. I would be appalled with the idea of any educator using my talk. Um, I might be concerned about them swooping me. I might also be concerned that they're not accessing something that's been peer reviewed, something that's published, et cetera, et cetera. So those are just some thoughts I have. Uh, what all are you thinking about maybe as content creators? Well, I'm just to follow up on what you said more than the question, Rachel, I would be curious to see if there was even something as simple as an opt-in checkbox when people are registering, yeah. 
you know, make my talk available for X, Y, or Z, yep. um, how many people would just opt in, right? And right. maybe it's, yeah, maybe it wouldn't be a problem. Maybe, nope, maybe a lot of people would have concerns and there would be low engagement and then we might want to figure out why. And so, but yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's not an issue. Maybe people would be excited to have their talks accessible because they're already doing the work and mm -hmm. appreciate the opportunity to have a, a longer lasting platform than, um, yeah. Absolutely. And maybe they could say, yes, and you can contact me if your class wanted to have a Zoom with me or have a discussion with me or if your students had questions. I mean, that would be like the deepest level, maybe, right, is to actually start a dialogue with the scientist. I love that idea. Yeah. That also spreads the word. So when you opt in like that, you are becoming a consultant to the world for your, for your particular area. And probably the number of people that will take advantage of that will be very small, but even if it's something, that'd be terrific. Mm -hmm. um, I had an idea too, and I passed this by Ben a little bit. I think as uh, botany educators, we all teach certain topics. And I was wondering if there would be some ways of having, um, how do you do it? Um, how do you teach photosynthesis? How deep do you go? You know, do you, um, what are your goals for that lesson, those lessons on photosynthesis? Uh, what are the main points? And, I, and, or perhaps, you know, we all teach maybe flower structure and pollination syndromes and, um, and just have um, just kind of best practices and share, share our ideas around good evidence-based teaching practices when it comes to, um, you name the topic uh, that we all kind of have a, a say. And I'd love to know what Rachel and Maya and Ben and, and Adam and Jennifer do. How, do you, how many lessons do you devote to photosynthesis? Do you, you know, and maybe even in a grade school, like you said, Jennifer, what do you do with that? We all kind of do that. Yeah. We had a great discussion kind of about that. You probably were there, maybe, um, when we were talking with the community college participants at Bonnie, and they were talking about they would really like guidance about some of these core concepts, um, especially as they're thinking about developing courses that that can transfer readily to other types of schools. And so I think this is part, and you know, Jennifer, we we can bring this forward to the board is like talking about, first of all, we we are working on, you know, deep overhauls of our website and making of resources available. Um, but I think, you know, we can content dump all day on a website about like how I teach photosynthesis. Here's my PowerPoint. But building communities, and this is kind of where Barney 360 comes in, like if people wanted to get together and we picked a topic like photosynthesis and say educators and future educators, we could just have, you know, a, a conversation just like this about a topic. Um, I think that would be really rich and interesting. Yeah, and if we combine that with maybe one of the leading researchers on photosynthesis who could keep us really current. So is there someone who has written a review paper recently um, on, on the overall processes and what are the, the new, newest, latest things? We would then combine keeping current and also then keeping, um, you know, like today I taught the light response curve and I had some problems, you know, that I associated with it and I tried to connect it to the light reaction machinery and um, but who knows if I'm not doing it as well as someone else or get some ideas. Maybe another Bio360 talk could be just that, right? Yeah, yeah, I like that idea a lot. Yeah, it also bears mentioning that Ecological Society of America has been toying with those same questions and they have now come up with their own framework. They call it 4DEE. -E. It's very similar to the Next oh. Generation Science Standards for K through 12. So there's models to look at, you know, but I will say, you know, like 
that's that is a big part for K through 12 of where how they because that was the whole reason behind forming the next gen science standards was to create a little more um, seamlessness from one state to another. And granted, not all states have accepted it, but almost all states, even those that did not, have revised their standards to be consistent with it for exactly that reason. So it's worth looking at if you're if that's a, a priority. So um, I like the idea, Bob, of doing that, especially as a uh, botany 360, okay. where there can be informal conversation um, around the topics. Okay. Um, I am interested in, in going back to the challenges of using these talks that will be recorded at the meeting and how we can address those. Um, another challenge that, or at least something I don't fully understand is how does copyright work yeah. Um, yeah. for somebody presenting, but the, the capture is being done by the society. Um, and if that is being published to the web, in what, to what extent is that now published data um, such that copyright would be in question if you tried to use your same figure in a publication mm -hmm. or um, from like a nomenclature standpoint if you like named a new thing entity is that the source the citation yeah um i don't have answers to that yeah um i also would want to think about if these are going to be published what uh license goes with them are they Creative Commons licensed mm -hmm. or are they, uh, the copyright is retained yeah. or is, are those check boxes that we want to have? I, I think because of the threat of data loss, Creative Commons could be you know, dangerous in that situation, but depending on the kind of talk, it might be an appropriate choice. Would we um, broadly be in support of having these on YouTube as opposed to behind a paywall and they go away? Uh, I, I mean, my feeling is I think what somebody, maybe Adam, I'm not sure who already expressed that if people sign up, I think it's great. Mm -hmm. I don't know to what extent people will be scared off by the the risks of the data being publicly available and to some extent previously published when they try to publish it more formally. Society organizers may also have thoughts on that just because yeah. we want, we don't want to disincent, you know, we don't want to make it less attractive to come to the conference and experience this stuff. Yes, that, that is always the issue that like, if, if you're not on the other side of like meeting planning, it's sometimes hard to understand. Like it's frustrating for a lot of us to be like, why couldn't I see the posters that were at the botany meeting? They weren't digital ever. Well, the reason why is because the poster hall is where vendors are and vendors pay a lot of money to take part in that. That, that helps our bottom line of having the meeting. The concern is if the posters were online, there's less traffic in the conference oh. venue disincentivizing the vendors. So I could foresee that it makes sense to have kind of an embargo on a lot of this content until the in-person conference is truly done. Um, and including posters, I think it would be amazing if people could do like a two or three minute recorded version of a poster and have it available. However, this is a huge new like digital ask. I know our staff are particularly exhausted after a conference. I don't know if it's the sort of thing you could batch and hold and like not release it till like August 15th or something through YouTube. Well, and, and that may just be an organic solution too, yeah. because someone's got to do that and they're exhausted. So it's going to be a bad, you know what I mean? There's a lot of follow-up that we have to do right afterwards. And it's a lot of organizing and squaring things up. So the delay may just be inevitable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, like too bad guys, <laughs> you know, we're busy. We'll get to it as soon as we can. There's also, I mean, you know, there's also ways to have like unlisted, yeah. you know, um, 
videos and things on YouTube. And that could be a middle ground between full public access and maybe, you know, maybe there's, uh, you know, maybe act, maybe we have a list of resources and that's curated based on, or access is curated based on membership, you know, society membership, or I'm just throwing ideas out there. But if, if we're concerned about the, you know, trying to balance open science with, you know, protecting the, the viability of the organ, you know, organizing these conferences and the in-person value and all of these different things. I think maybe there's some opportunities there to, to think about. I don't think it's either but, or. I think there's a spectrum that we could explore. I think a challenge though, is that almost by definition, we're gonna take this work and then rebroadcast it to some new audience. And so it's not just the members who would be using it, but anybody with whom the user, the member chooses to share it. Um, and sometimes that's going to be digital sharing because students are online or some students are online. And so it's going to be sort of not necessarily ephemeral. Um, an another concern that got brought up in the planning meeting was violations of copyright that are contained within the presentations mm. and who would be responsible for those violations. Um, if a copyrighted image, for example, appeared in more than reasonable use yeah. in somebody's presentation, then to what extent is the Botanical Society responsible for that infringement? Yeah. And how would that be policed? Yeah. Um, I've, I've made some notes on the, I made a new PowerPoint slide and I've added a few notes here. Thank you. Are there other ways that the next conference could be even more accessible to us as educators and content creators? I guess I'll just put in, I'll just say it was really great um, when, you know, the meetings were not, I wasn't able to attend this year, but other years that things have been online. Um, I was certainly able to involve certain research students or other undergraduates in the conference, in the online conference um, because of, you know, the lower cost of, of participating, right? Um, just being able to access online and then for an undergraduate student having those reduced rates. And I think some students really had a great experience being able to listen, just listen to talks, right? And then I would meet with them every, you know, every day and just say, hey, let's just have a conversation about what things you found interesting and what, you know, what, uh, you know, what questions do you have? And we can kind of just talk about the science. And I just thought, yeah, I mean, I know I'm not unique in that, but just I want to highlight that as a really great opportunity for people who may not have the time or interest or certainly money to travel to, you know, on-site conferences, thinking about undergrad students. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I think we're really impressed with how much more accessible our meetings are. The numbers show that year on year out as we've had these options. So I think there are so many compelling reasons moving forward to continue to to have that. Um, but um, my question to you, maybe Adam, is like, could you have recreated that kind of magic of like having your students explore, talking about what they were interested in, not during the physical meeting, like during the rest of the year with like a current class? Oops. Well, I mean, and that's kind of why I'm here, because I'm interested in having those experiences, but I think a lot of the limitations, right, they're tough, right, to figure out in terms of access and, you know, I can't, you know, I might be able to afford to pay the conference registration for a few research students, but imagining, you know, registering X number of students in a botany class so that they can all have access to the talks, 
you know, that's a little bit less feasible, especially at a, you know, resource limited institution. Um, so anyway, I'm just really excited that there's other people who are thinking about these things and, and um, yeah, that's yeah. kind of my perspective. Well, I agree completely. Um, so we're at time now. Um, I want to sincerely thank all of you so much for participating. I hope this was useful and inspiring. It's good to see you all. It's good to see our community. I love the botany uh, 360 sort of an idea, especially seeing my fellow Westerners here. I love it. Um, and um, I will be bringing some of these notes and ideas forward uh, to the board as we start talking. Well, it's already well on its way and you got the hottest gossip in town. Like, yeah, Botany 2023 is well on its way. It's going to be amazing and hopefully accessible um, and even more so throughout the year to all our students. So um, thank you for your time and uh, good luck in all your endeavors until we see each other again. Thank you. And thank you, Rachel, for organizing. Absolutely. And, uh, putting yep. this all together. Yay. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Take care.